video game criticism is exorbitantly capable of making or breaking the successes of any of their subjects. Whether there were ulterior motives involved, or the reviewer was having a particularly bad week, a poor reception from a large reviewing organization can almost guarantee low sales. Being on the receiving end of a critical panning within the video game industry is almost a death sentence, and for Valhalla Game Studios, it seems to have been. Despite being composed of former Team Ninja staff and led by Tomonobu Itagaki himself, Valhalla Game Studios Devil's Third was received so poorly that the studio hasn't produced another title since. Itagaki took a five-year hiatus from video game work, and the studio's dreams of a trilogy would never come to fruition. Ivan's violent adventure to prevent global destruction seemed to be the polar opposite of what the critics were wanting, and they took every opportunity to elaborate on the game's mistakes. But was the game as disastrous as the critics claimed? Was there some predisposition to dislike Devil's Third because of its Wii U exclusivity and bizarre character design? Was Unreal Engine 3 too archaic by 2015? Or did the game's humour just not land? To truly answer those questions, let's take a little journey back in time. The footage for this video was recorded on stream. If you'd like to see behind the curtain, and joke around or be blown away by my antics on stream, join the Discord to receive notifications. And for weekly review videos like this, please subscribe. Joe Rogan in my game. Twenty fifteen was a dark time. EA had tossed out Star Wars Battlefront while they rebuilt Maxis into a mobile developer. League of Legends was at its most popular, Take-Two were closing a bunch of its international developers, and Donald Trump was leading the Republican nomination. Nintendo's home console, the Wii U, had been a sales disaster, and during 2015, they announced their upcoming replacement, the Nintendo Switch. Developers creating games for the Wii U were suddenly put under a lot of pressure to deliver before the new system arrived. And of the 29 Wii U games released during 2015, only 10 have a Metacritic rating above 80%. Nintendo themselves were releasing poor quality games, like Mario Party 10 and the infamous Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. But right at the bottom of the list lies our hero. At a measly 43 points, Devil's Third had earned the title of Worst Wii U Game of the Year. IGN's review claimed it was the kind of soulless, perfunctory action game they fear people judging the medium of video games by, while GameSpot said that Devil's Third is near impossible to recommend. Technical problems, shallow gameplay loops, and unwelcome difficulty were among the main criticisms within almost all of the other 54 Metacritic reviews, and my experience will not get the benefit of post-launch patches to clear any of those problems away. Despite this, Itagaki was still positive about the studio's future. Valhalla Game Studio was founded in 2008 by former Team Ninja staff after the release of the reboot Ninja Gaiden sequel. Itagaki had left Tecmo with intention to sue after he wasn't awarded bonuses he was promised, and convinced a contingent of his colleagues to migrate with him. Throughout the next seven years, Valhalla would seek a publisher for Devil's Third, who would assist them in placing the game onto the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Valhalla were eventually successful in brokering a partnership with THQ, but with their bankruptcy and liquidation in 2012, Valhalla were left high and dry. Korean multimedia organization Dubik were brought aboard to fill THQ's absence, but Dubik also went out of business during 2013. In 2014, Devil's Third was displayed by Nintendo at E3 and released on the Wii U in the following year. Devil's Third seems to have been doomed to fail from the start, and it isn't surprising that the game has the reported problems that it has but the fundamental design 
wouldn't have been compromised during these publisher and platform changes. So was the original design just poorly conceived? Devil's Third is a third person shooter with a robust action combat system existing alongside the shooter mechanics. Ivan is a highly competent whirling death meat machine able to wield any firearm or bladed weapon he gets a hold of. At the beginning of most levels, Ivan will be deployed with his katana and a couple of varying automatic weapons and maybe a shotgun or a sniper rifle. These automatic weapons change from time to time, but for the most part Ivan's weapons will feel very similar. They all have similar aiming mechanics and recoil effects. Hand to hand combat is well rounded, featuring attack combos, blocking, dodging and a targeted jumping attack for extra style. Ivan is very athletic and can use his impressive vertical leap to scale pretty high walls. He's also quick on his feet and is able to keep a low profile when required. I especially enjoyed the slide move as it allowed swift gap closing while also allowing gunfire to pass overhead. Further, there are a few different set piece segments to keep things fresh as the game charges forward, like boss battles and vehicle sections. As far as having enough to do, Devil's Third delivers and provides a handful of systems to master as the narrative progresses. So the criticism of the game's shallowness seems unfounded. There's a surprising quantity of enemy types, who are best handled in different ways, that keep the various combat encounters fresh and still ensure that the game doesn't overstay its welcome. In the early stages, the enemies aren't mind-blowing or anything, but they're filling their role perfectly fine. More hand-to-hand -hand enemies are introduced, then a mini-boss of sorts appears. Things get silly in terms of theming, but the enemy designs are unique and engaging, and the game continues to deliver new opponents throughout its runtime. Most enemies are susceptible to headshots, but since this game is exclusive to the Wii U, the use of the Wii U gamepad or a pro controller to engage the aiming is an unfortunate necessity. That being said, there's a generous auto-aim system that keeps the shooting shockingly tight and helps to mitigate the controller limitation. I did find a few instances where the shotgun projectile hitbox didn't engage as the weapon was fired, so when enemies were very close they could avoid damage, but in most cases this did not occur. Combat with the hand-to-hand -hand weapons has excellent feedback, likely refined by the developer's previous experiences with the Ninja Gaiden reboot and while the system is shallower than the likes of Bayonetta or Xenoclash, when compared to games that are also primarily third person shooters, Devil's Third's combat is significantly more filled out. Ivan has heavy and light attacks, with different animations depending on the weapon being used, and can also engage different execution animations depending on nearby environmental pieces. The hitboxes aren't immaculate, but as far as Devil's Third's contemporaries, they aren't any worse. And the bosses are just as competently constructed. There are eight bosses throughout the game that don't have explicit paths to defeat them, but some are more focused on a particular aspect of Ivan's combat capabilities. The bosses are usually battled within a tiny room, but there are occasions where shooting the boss is the only means to defeating it. Molotov, Jane Doe, Soversini and Ludmilla Karenina are ideally battled with Ivan's ranged weapons, while Big Mouse, Grundla Saha, the guinea pig and Isaac Kumano are better fought with or exclusively tackled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Molotov is an encounter that can only be battled from afar and acts as a climax for the tutorial. The player hides behind some chest high walls and shoots at the boss and his adds. Jane Doe is a rather disappointing encounter that acts as a more mobile version of the Molotov fight. Jane walks around the arena with an automatic weapon while some ninja enemies continually chase Ivan around the courtyard. It's hectic and engaging, but quite underwhelming. Ludmilla is another substandard encounter, although it isn't too similar to Molotov. Ludmilla wanders around the arena while invisible although her invisibility isn't particularly effective, so the encounter is an unfortunate missed opportunity. Every other battle is either acceptable or incredible, 
or downright unbelievable. Saha is ridiculously aggressive, and the Kumano fight looks like something from another game. I don't want to spoil some of these encounters because of how amazing the reveals are. I'll show them later on, just to demonstrate to those who won't ever play the game how tremendous some of the encounter setups are. Instead, let's talk about the less good things. There are problems with Devil's Third, of course there are, and I won't gloss over them and present this game as something that it isn't. There are numerous level design problems, and some odd difficulty spikes that stop the game's momentum dead in its tracks. The levels often devolve into barren hallways with nowhere to hide, or an entry into the battle environment hasn't been ideally situated, or the player will be dropped into an arena with enemies shipped in to shoot at. This game has some insane stakes and follows some really unexpected tangents, so the many streets filled with abandoned vehicles seem somewhat dishonest and almost distract from the absurdity when it gets going. And then sometimes the game deems it necessary to spam a bunch of enemies somewhere, but it never fully commits. In the Big Mouse boss encounter, for example, there are 12 regular enemies standing in lines ready to shoot at the player once the movie ends. When the player is inevitably killed here, the game doesn't respawn these enemies. Games Farm would be distraught. Other times, the game embarks upon a different gameplay type, such as the vehicle sections, but the mechanics aren't as well tuned as the rest of the game, and they feel cumbersome and ultimately mediocre as a result. This car sequence looks like a great time, but the controls are awkward for no understandable reason. While we're on the subject of the game's appearance, Devil's Third uses Unreal Engine 3 and had to be functional on a Wii U. Unreal Engine 4 was available to developers by 2014, so the game could have been able to enjoy the advances that came between numbered versions. But there's a decent chance that the Wii U may not have been able to handle the game's current assets within that new engine. The system's CPU and GPU combination was cobbled together from modern components, as well as components used for the Nintendo Wii, which were archaic by 2006 standards. This meant that the Wii U could handle HD textures and higher poly counts, but when a lot of activity was occurring on screen, the system would struggle. As a result, whenever a lot of enemies appear during Devil's Third, the frame rate takes a bit of a hit. It wasn't possible to optimize their way out, so Valhalla should have altered their plans accordingly. This does make some things seem unnecessary though. Despite having the capability, some of the textures just aren't up to standard. Their inexplicably low resolutions causes these textures to draw attention and break any immersion that the player may have been experiencing. Similarly, some large objects exist in the environment for no good reason. At one stage, while adventuring through a Japanese theme park, Ivan passes by a replica of Mount Fuji. It's rightfully the size of a mountain, but it didn't have to be a model. It could have been a render. I really don't understand why these things have been done this way, and it only serves to cause performance issues, irrespective of the target platform. It's a shame too, because the bright and colorful areas are great. The palette is heavily saturated, and most locations are accented by pops of red and yellow, that almost juxtapose the violence Ivan is committing. And say what you will about Ivan's design, but it is exactly the degree of dumb cheesiness that I love. He's too cool to take off his sunglasses, and he refuses to wear a shirt throughout the entire adventure. I bet he rides a motorcycle too. Ivan is one of the few characters in the game whose name I can remember, and for a mixture of reasons. The supporting casts get very little time to make impressions, and mostly choose to yell their character traits at Ivan as he stoically walks toward them. But don't let that stoicism fool you, Ivan can be a spiteful bastard at times. <laughs> oh. Oh. Darkness. It's where you'll find the true light. Wow. <laughs> what? 
His affection for C4 is supposed to demonstrate a tenderness within him. But I think Ivan's surrender to the US military when he's shown the destruction he and his associates had caused was a better indicator of a compassion for others. His life had been about training for that moment. And when it came, Ivan's immediate response was to eject and deal with the consequences. Other characters like the Delta Force squad leader, whose name is Captain Bob, get a fair amount of screen time, but only use it to talk about the mission. Maybe their tone changes as the game goes on, but they won't often get much depth. Even Caraway is just a dude who gives Ivan orders and has a kooky backstory. The game's narrative begins with a mysterious man engaging a series of explosive devices attached to satellites in orbit. This causes a bunch of electrical devices to stop functioning, plunging the world into chaos. The US government is very quickly aware of the group behind the action and needs additional help to save the day. Enter Ivan a super-powered, convicted terrorist who is kept deep inside an isolated vault underneath Guantanamo Bay, who works for the US government for the promise of musical instruments. Ivan is quickly sent to Panama to track the group responsible for the attack. After some investigation, Ivan learns that his former squad are the cause, and also that his sister-girlfriend character, who should be dead, is in fact not dead. The journey travels from Panama to an island off of the northern coast of Japan, where the group had been based, and the player follows Ivan's deadly rampage across that island. He must overcome his former allies and uncover some secret medical experiments they had been conducting before finally confronting his former mentor. Kumano yells his ideology that involves inciting nuclear war, and then the two have a fight in the imaginary fire realm. C4 gets killed again but doesn't die, and Ivan gets to go back to his cell. It's fine. C4 and the medical experiments don't really seem that consequential. And even the fact that all of Ivan's old friends have even super powers doesn't really matter that much. The player doesn't get to learn about what more damage would be done if Ivan fails, and the destruction that the organization had already caused was so severe that their plan to nuke the most populated cities on the planet had already kind of succeeded without the missiles actually exploding. And there won't ever be a satisfactory explanation for the results of the medical experiments. Oh, and uh, here's that clip I talked about before. Am I gonna... Oh. Oh. Shit. Devil's Third was the primary reason I purchased a Wii U. Yeah, another console to play a weirdo third-person shooter, I know. But I don't believe that purchase was a bad one. I've played plenty of games that do things better than Devil's Third, but I've also played much worse. Some of the games I have played have been more competent and more mindfully adhere to the game development theory than Devil's Third does. But they weren't as enjoyable. Devil's Third is so cliche, so predictable. There should be no measure by which this game is fantastic, and yet it just is. Everything Valhalla put into the final product has created that perfect amalgamation of silly camp and legitimate excitement. I don't enjoy Devil's Third ironically, I genuinely adore this game, I don't encourage anyone to play it themselves. In the end, I can't agree with the conclusions of those who reviewed Devil's Third at release. There's a lot more fun to be had here, and the technical problems aren't as debilitating as many made it seem. It isn't a particularly heady experience, but not every game has to be. If the player's time is so valuable that every game has to be a life-changing experience, then of course Devil's Third would be a waste of time. But is anyone really that important? 
The technical issues do exist, mostly as a consequence of the engine and some poor level design choices, but not so severely as to decrease the game's value by 30 to 40 points IGN and GameSpot. To ignore the humour in Devil's Third is to ignore any personality that the game has, and to be naive enough to expect some western style grimy miserable army man game is bound to end in confusion. Devil's Third breaks the conventions of the time by adhering so strictly to them that it seems ironic, and I think that's magnificent. Oh, okay. Just a minute. More cool guys next time, trying to save a different party planet.